place we're going to be is in Matthew chapter 26, but to set that up, I'm going to first show you a video that's about, excuse me, about one minute long, all right? So with that, the video happens to be the exact passage we are in today. The video's a portion from the Passion of the Christ. Can you kill the lights, please? And then watch this. And the Messiah bar elachachai echo eana taxon bar nash yefe bayamin chayil te paana nesh. So that is where we are. Um, Palm Sunday has already happened. By the time we get here, it's early, early, early Friday morning. It's dark. It's probably three in the morning. And Jesus is being judged. Um, So Matthew chapter 26, beginning of verse 57, this is what we read. And those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Caiaphas. Caiaphas is the high priest that you just saw that slaps Jesus at the end. Where the scribes and the elders were assembled. But Peter followed Jesus at a distance to the high priest's courtyard, and he went in and he sat with the servants to see the end. Now the chief priests, the elders, and all the council, they sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death. But they found none. Even though many false witnesses came forward, they found none. However, At last, two false witnesses came forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and to build it in three days. And the high priest arose and said to Jesus, Do you answer nothing? What is it these men testify against you? But Jesus, he kept silent. And the high priest answered and said to Jesus, I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the Son of God. Tell us if you are the Messiah. Jesus says to him, it is as you said. In other words, I am. You better believe it. Nevertheless, I say to you, hereafter you will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power and coming on the clouds of heaven. And then the high priest tore his clothes, saying, He has spoken blasphemy. What further need do we have of witnesses? Look, now you have heard his blasphemy. Verse 66, what do you think? They answered and said, He is deserving of death. And they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one that struck you? So let's stop here and start putting some things together. So Jesus is he's standing there before uh, Caiaphas. He's been arrested. And Caiaphas, uh, imagine this, he uh, is going to pronounce judgment on Jesus. Imagine men judging God. But that's what's taking place here. Uh, This court is nothing more than a kangaroo court. It's illegal on a number of accounts, and the deck of false witnesses is stacked against them. And what brings the accusers to their feet is when Caiaphas says, are you the Christ? Are you the Messiah? It is as you said. Yes, I am. What further evidence do we need? He has committed blasphemy. Uh, Let me stop here, and let's define what blasphemy is. Because of this reason, I I especially want to get you to understand this. Uh, Jesus said elsewhere in the New Testament that uh, men can be forgiven of any sin except for blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. So I have Christians that come to me sometimes and say, I've received Christ, I've repented of my sin, but uh, I'm afraid that I've committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit and I'm not going to be forgiven. Listen, if you've asked Christ to forgive you, if you've repented, then you have not committed the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit in the sense that Jesus has spoken of. Let me show you why, all right? 
So here, the term blasphemy has two main meanings. Uh, one is when a person claims for themselves the rights and attributes of God. So that's what Jesus is saying, right? Are you the Messiah? Are you the Christ? Yes, I am He. He is the only person in the entire universe, in the history of the world, that could rightly make that claim. Anybody else making that claim, it would have been blasphemy. But He could make it. Right? But also, another application of blasphemy is when a person curses or reviles or denies God. So here's the scoop. A Christian will say, well, I've asked Christ to forgive me, but before that I used to deny God and I cursed Him. That's a, the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit. Therefore, I'm going to go to hell. Here's the deal. The Holy Spirit's job, so to speak, uh, for you and I, is to bear testimony, bear witness of who Jesus is. That He is the Messiah, that He is the Christ. Exactly what Caiaphas said. Who are you? Caiaphas rejected it. But the Holy Spirit, His job is to bear witness that Jesus is the Messiah and you must receive Him for the forgiveness of your sin. Right? So, if you have asked Christ to forgive you of your sin and you've repented, then you will not die committing the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit because you responded to the witness of the Holy Spirit. You said yes to Christ. Does that make sense? If you die saying no to Christ, denying, reviling, cursing God, say no to Christ, then you blaspheme the Holy Spirit and you cannot be forgiven and you, because you died in your sin. Make sense? So here in this text, what do we have? We, we have Caiaphas who blames Jesus for claiming to be God, but Jesus himself does claim to be the Messiah. But then what does Caiaphas do? He commits blasphemy by cursing, reviling, and denying the Lord. So Caiaphas is actually the guilty one, but he's claiming that Jesus is the guilty one. So that's the backdrop. <coughs> and let me show you here three things. All right, put it together for you. You ready? Three things we find in this text. Uh, number one, we note the conspiracy against Jesus in verses 57 through 60. He's brought before Caiaphas. They've already got their verdict. They're going to pronounce him guilty, no matter how things go. As far as they could see, Jesus was guilty. No matter the evidence against Him or not against Him, they're going to get their false witnesses. They're going to get their lies. They're going to get their, their trumped up case against Him to make sure that they can pronounce Jesus guilty even though He's absolutely innocent. And let me give you an illustration of how this works today because this worked since the history of men. Somebody wanting to accuse somebody else uh, of something, even though they haven't done it, they will lie about that person. To bring a guilty verdict to get rid of them. Hence, go back to 2012. Mitt Romney is running to be president of the United States. Some of you will remember this. Harry Reid says Mitt Romney has not filed his taxes in 10 years. Right? That went all over the news media giants. And uh, the news media reported as if it was true. And then Mitt Romney lost the election. After that election... CNN interviewed Harry Reid because it turned out uh, everybody was able to admit that, no, Mitt Romney did actually file his taxes for those 10 years. So CNN interviews Harry Reid and asks Harry Reid, um, did you know, knowingly lie about Mitt Romney? Yeah. Do you feel bad that you lied about Mitt Romney? No. Why don't you feel bad? Because he lost the election, didn't he? That was the purpose, to bring false charges against him, to get him out of the way, it is A-OK. -okay. In a much grander sense, that's what's happening to Jesus. Bring the false charges against him to make sure that we can eliminate Jesus. So allow me to give some background on the trial of Jesus before we continue. Uh, everybody is deserving of a fair trial, even according to the Old Testament law. Everybody's deserving of a fair trial. Deuteronomy chapter 16 says, You shall appoint judges and officers in all of your gates, which the Lord your God gives you according to your tribes. And they shall judge the people, look, with just judgment, right? That's not what's happening to Jesus here. Text continues, You shall not pervert justice. You shall not show partiality, nor take a bribe. For a bribe blinds the eyes of the wise and twists the words of the righteous. So it's, it's like, no, the, a fair trial is what you're obligated, is what everybody has the right to, a fair 
trial. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, you find that the Bible supports the guarantee of a right to a public trial. Guarantee a trial will not be at night. Guarantee a defense counsel, which Jesus didn't have. Guarantee at least two reliable, honest witnesses. Guarantee the right of the defendant to present his own witness. Add to that, Deuteronomy chapter 19 has another safeguard in for the person who is, who is a defendant. Deuteronomy chapter 19 teaches this. If there's a person that's a defendant, and there's a witness against them that is called, and for example, this person uh, is then found guilty because of the testimony of this witness, and this person that's found guilty is then put to death as a death sentence, If it turns out that that witness gave a false testimony, then that witness will experience the same sentence as the one that was put to death. Can you imagine if that happened in our courts now? Wow. So a safeguard, however, people get around the Word of God, rejected it. They certainly did it with Jesus, but did it with others. Adding to this list of how court was to be conducted, according to Simon Greenleaf, A famous professor of law at Harvard in the 1800s, rabbinical law also required that a sentence of death could not be carried out until the third day after the verdict, and it required that members of the court were to fast. So Jesus wasn't carried out after the third day. He's brought to trial, judge, crucified, right? And certainly they didn't fast and pray. This trial was entirely illegal. It was loaded with false witnesses. It was during the night, probably close to 3 in the morning. Not open to public. No defense counsel. Executed within the same day and on down the list. Notice also in verse 59, we are told that the chief priests and the elders were in the room and all the council. All the council would be the members of the Sanhedrin, 71. So there's a lot of the leaders, the elite of the religious leaders who knew the law of the Old Testament for a fair trial. But, all of them were seeking false witness against Jesus to put him to death. So why the legal trial? Because they did not want the truth. Now, the Bible talks about that. Even in the last days, the Bible tells us that uh, uh, Peter tells us that people will be willfully ignorant. In other words, they'll know the truth, but they will choose to believe the lie. They don't want to face it. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, God tells us because they did not love the truth, God gives them over to the lie. That's what happened with Caiaphas. He didn't want to know the truth. He didn't love the truth. He loved to believe the lie. He just wanted to pronounce that Jesus wasn't God. He wanted to eliminate the thought of the truth of God from his mind. I was watching a program the other day, and this individual on there, and I know a little bit of his background, he says that he's talking to this person who came upon some good fortune, and he says to the person, Isn't that just wonderful how when you do good, the universe gives back to you? Now, I I, I know the person's background. And and, uh, the reason why the universe is because once you admit God, you've got a problem. Because now you've got to deal with truth and justice and holiness and righteousness. But the universe, eh, right? Check this out, too. Listen to these verses from Peter. I mean, from, from Paul to Timothy. 2 Peter chapter 3. Know this. Listen to these words. In the last days, perilous times will come. Now listen to this list of characteristics. For men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, unloving, unforgiving, slanders, without self-control, brutal, despisers of good. Man, does that sound like today? Traitors. Everybody's accusing everybody else of being a traitor. Uh, headstrong, haughty, lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. What's the power? The truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. Having a form of godliness, going to church, but denying, like Caiaphas, who Jesus is. The Messiah. The way, the truth, and the life. Nobody comes to the Father except by Having a form of godliness but denying the power of the truth of the Lord Jesus Christ. We live in a world where people say, well, I, I, I'm a very spiritual person. Well, what does that mean? I believe in the universe. Yeah, spiritual, right? So it's that a form of godliness, 
but denying the power of the truth of Christ. Uh, So we see these things today, but here it applies to Jesus. They rejected him. They rejected the truth no matter what. They already had their verdict, and Jesus was guilty. Number two, it's the confession of Jesus. Look at this. Verse 61 again. The false witnesses come forward and said, This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. The high priest says, Did you really say this? But Jesus is silent, we are told. He answered nothing. Verse 63, And the high priest answered him, I put you under oath of the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ. Tell us if you are the Messiah. It is. Verse 64, Exactly as you say, Yes, I am. Uh, The frustration of Caiaphas, the Sanhedrin, and the rest is too much. And according to verse 60, look at this, um, they found none. They brought their false witnesses, but they couldn't find any. And and finally, two false witnesses come forward. Finally, we got two. But Mark and Luke uh, both tell us, or Mark tells us, that the two, two false witnesses couldn't even agree. But they got enough out of them to build their case against Jesus and proclaim He's guilty. You say you can build the temple. You say you're the Messiah. You are guilty. Are you the Christ? It is as you said. There's a lot of uh, liberal critics that say Jesus never said anywhere in the New Testament that He was the Messiah. Folks, right here He says it. Are you the Messiah? That's what Christ means. Messiah in Hebrew. You, you said it, buckaroo. And throughout the New Testament, especially in the Gospel of John, repeatedly, Jesus makes a claim for himself. You said it. You better believe it. I am the Messiah. And then Jesus takes the spiritual knife, like the Word of God, drives it into Caiaphas a little bit further and twists it. And this drives Caiaphas over the edge. He says, it is as he said, verse 64, nevertheless, look at these words again. Listen to this. I say to you, Caiaphas, hereafter you, Caiaphas, will see the Son of Man sitting at the right hand of the power woo, and coming on the clouds of heaven. What is Jesus talking about? He's taken a passage from Daniel the prophet from the Old Testament that's messianic about the Messiah. He's saying, this applies to me. I'm coming on the clouds. Look at this. Daniel, chapter 7, writes, I was watching in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of a Man coming with the clouds of heaven. There he is. He came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Then to him was given dominion and glory in the kingdom that all peoples, nations, and languages should serve him. So Caiaphas knows exactly what the claim is that Jesus is making. You mean I'm going to submit to you? You're the one? And Daniel continued, his dominion, Caiaphas gets it. His dominion is never... <coughs> excuse me, is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away in his kingdom, the one which shall not be destroyed. Caiaphas gets what Jesus is saying. You're telling me you're, dom- you're, telling me you're God in the flesh. You are telling me you're the Messiah. And, and, and go, Caiaphas is over the edge. He's over the, he, he can't handle this. Jesus is saying, look, Caiaphas, you're judging me. I'm going to go to a cross. I'm going to die. I'm going to raise again. And one day I'm coming back and I'm going to be judging you. And how's that judgment going to go for you, Caiaphas? Here's how it's going to go. Revelation chapter 1. Behold, He is coming, that be Jesus, with the clouds. Again, no, Jesus said, I'm coming with the clouds. And every eye will see Him, even they who pierced Him. And all the tribes of the earth will mourn because of Him. I am the Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end, says the Lord, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So these are the claims He's making about Himself. Right? Revelation 20, John writes, Then I saw a great white throne in Him, that be Jesus, who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God. And books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. By the way, you want your name to be in the book of life. You know what the books are? The books are the sins of every person who's rejected Christ. 
Look at this, because this passage continues. And the dead were judged according to the works by the things which were written in the books. And they were judged. And anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Caiaphas, this awaits you. You judge me now. I am coming back again. And you will be judged. Caiaphas is horrified by what he hears. This is enough. Verse 65. He tears his garment. Number three, last thing. Ready? It's the condemnation against Jesus. Their hatred is unleashed. Verse 66. Caiaphas tears his garment. He says, what do you think? They answered and said, he is deserving of death. This is what you saw in the video. And then they spat in his face and beat him, and others struck him with the palms of their hands, saying, Prophesy to us, Christ, who is the one who struck you? So what's happening? The Supreme Court of Men have judged God to get rid of him. Same thing happens today a little bit differently, right? Our Supreme Court judges, passes judgment to get rid of God. The Bible tells us that men and women are made in the image of God, but the court says, well, wait a minute, you can't say what a man or woman is, right? You know that's Satan's attack against God. Uh, listen, we live in a world right now that says if a, if a man wants to say he's a woman, he's a woman. If he's a woman, wants to be a man. Whatever it is, it's coming to a time where a person says, I'm a dog, that'll be okay. It's, listen, I'm serious. That's coming. Uh, the, the, you have the laws. You have the courts. In, in Alabama, you, you can't have Ten Commandments at the court. Get rid of God. So they judge, get rid of God back here. They still do it. In the schools, you can do anything you want as long as you don't pray in the name of Jesus. And you, can, you can say all you want about Muhammad, but you better not say anything about Jesus. Isn't that interesting? This is the problem they have. They have a problem with Jesus here. It, it shows us that it, 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 it's satanic. It's spiritual. What, what, what's going on? Um, the media. Mention Jesus, you'll get fired. Mention Jesus, you'll be cut from the live feed unless you use him in a curse thing. Um, entertainment, mock Jesus. So here, what do they do? They spit in Jesus' face. And they beat him and struck him with the palms of their hands. And they say, Matthew says, prophesy, who hit you? Why do they say prophesy who hit you? Because Mark and Luke tell us that Jesus was blindfolded. So he has, he's blindfolded. Who hit you? You the Christ? Who hit you? Got it? So with that as the background, we can think, what could possibly be in this for me? I'm glad you asked. I'm going to give you three takeaways. You ready? These are all rather short. But we have hope. We have grace. We have mercy. We have forgiveness. You ready? These are all short. Number one is this. Receive His care for you in your darkest hour. Everyone will suffer. The test came back. And uh, it was bad news. And when I went to the doctor the last time, the test came back, and the doctor walks in. I ah, got a problem. Tells me what it is. You know, the first thing I did, I said, "Praise God." He looked at me. Are you crazy? And, and, and I said, "No." I said, "Now <coughs> I know something can be done." Turns out that was was correct. But whatever, I was happy at the moment. Um, some people get those phone calls from the doctor. Stage four. Stage three. Um, there's nothing we can do about your heart. Um, get some bad news. Um, while your wife was delivering your baby, she died. Um, your child's in a car accident. Your wife leaves you for another man. Your husband left you for another woman. Your children won't talk to you. Receive His care for you in your darkest hour. We've been in this dark hour with Jesus. Here, 
check, think of this. In Hebrews chapter 4, the Bible tells us that we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, who was in all points tested as we are. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That's great. Jesus Christ comes to us in our darkest hour that we might obtain mercy and find grace to help us in that moment. Think of this. When Jesus was praying in the Garden of Gethsemane, God sent an angel to minister to Jesus. In our darkest hour, according to Hebrews, God sends His Son for mercy and grace in our darkest time of need. Wow. Number two, recognize His love for you from His darkest hour. He was affected by our sin. Judged. We have an opportunity to be amazed by His grace. I had an interesting year. Um, Let me illustrate for you. Yesterday, or the last couple of days, excuse me, allergies, I'm sure. I had a lot of time to sit around, and I, so I watched a little bit of the Masters Golf Tournament, and, and uh, you know, ding, about as good as I can do in golf, just what you saw. Uh, so this past year, Arnold Palmer had died, very well loved, apparently. He's good friends with Jack Nicklaus, and so they're doing a tribute to Arnold Palmer and, and interviewed Jack Nicklaus, and there's one clip I'm watching, and apparently they were really good friends, and um, they asked Jack about that, and he said, when Arnold died, part of me died. And some of you have felt that. Uh, May 27th, 2016, uh, Pastor Lane died in an accident. Um, I didn't realize how close we were until he was gone. Uh, when I first came here, he was with me as a volunteer. Then he came on staff. And when Jack said that, about Arnold Palmer, I said, that's where I'm at. I feel like, you know, we've done ministry together. He strengthened me. The Lord strengthened me through him, you know, that kind of thing. And like part of me died. I'm not, I wasn't married to him. I'm not one of his children. It's there. It's real. And now that I'm going through my current stuff, whatever that stuff is, I've had a lot of time to be very introspective and, and, and be able to recognize even no matter what, His love for us is great. It's birthed in His darkest hour for our difficult time. Because those who know Him, we are going to go to the place, I've said this a million times here, quoting from Revelation, where there's no more pain, no more suffering, no more tears, no more death, because the former things have passed away. No more hospitals. No more morgues. No more medicine. We'll be in heaven with Jesus. Wow. We'll be in heaven with our loved ones. Part of some of you have died. Jesus loves you. One day. It's all over, baby. In a good way. In a very good way. Number three, and lastly, Respond to His grace for you from His darkest hour. Um, he came from heaven to earth. And what we got from Jesus was mercy and grace. Um, what, what's mercy? Mercy is not getting what you deserve. A lot of people will say, before they know Christ, oh, I just want what I deserve from God. That's a bad prayer. Bad prayer, bad prayer. Um, you don't want what you deserve. Christ got what you deserve crucified, right? He got that. Mercy is not getting the bad thing that you deserve. That's mercy. We get His mercy. But we also oh, get to respond to His grace. What's grace? Grace is getting the blessing that you don't deserve. I don't deserve heaven. I get it. 
because of His mercy, He was judged for me because of His grace. He's in heaven, and I'm going to be there. Because of His grace, He found me when I was lost. I was Tom, the loser. God saves the foolish thing. Go figure. So He picks me up from where I was washes me off, cleansed me, forgave me, set my feet on solid ground. He gave me life. He took me from Gardena to Orange County on a few different missions, or a few different places, to Corona and Riverside. Now Hemet. By the way, Hemet's my favorite place in the world. It really is. You might say, well, next to Jerusalem. I mean... Um, he saves us. His grace took me from who I was. He puts me in a pulpit to proclaim His grace. I don't get that. Because I know me. I wouldn't do that for me. His grace is so crazy that when I was in Israel just Recently, I had an opportunity to interview a UN ambassador. I had an opportunity to interview a TV producer. I had the—I mean, I'm, I'm Tom from Gardena, Riverside, Hemet. <laughs> Go figure. His grace for you is great, and no matter what it is we may go through in this life, praise God. Praise God. We are going to be with Him. But we have an opportunity, folks, that people would know the grace and the love and the hope and the forgiveness of Jesus next week, next Sunday, the big day. May we respond to His grace in, from His darkest hour in our difficult time. Thank you, Jesus. And may we tell others about His grace and mercy.